So today we're going to be discussing the quantum model of the atom, which is a more modern version of uh, the early models of Rutherford, Bohr, and what have you. And it started after scientists discovered that light could behave as both a particle, like that, or a wave, uh, depending on what characteristics you were looking at. And they wondered the same thing about electrons. And of course, because I'm discussing it, they also found that electrons could behave as particles and waves. And they, because they knew characteristics of waves already from observing sound and water waves and light waves, uh, they knew that waves that were confined, for example, waves that go around a nucleus, uh, could only vibrate at certain frequencies because otherwise they would be thrown off. For example, if this had gone like here, then the electron wouldn't line up with the confined space for its frequency and it would simply spiral into the nucleus. Now, what they found was that these frequencies that worked corresponded to different uh, energy levels within the atom. And they explained that this relationship corresponded to the energy for certain photons of light, which is, of course, given by the equation E, which is the energy of the photon, equals H, which is Planck's constant. We'll see more of that later. Uh, times of frequency. And the wave-like electron theory was later confirmed by experiments such as uh, interference, which are characteristics of waves and uh, wave particle uh, dual behavior. So the next thing we're going to be discussing is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is an important part of modern quantum physics. And basically, it can be explained by a simple metaphor, which has come to be known as Heisenberg's microscope. Basically, because we see electrons through their interactions with light, there's an inherent problem because you can either use light of a high wavelength which carries a lower energy however when it hits the electron you don't know to within about one wavelength where that electron is so it could be there's a high probability that it's somewhere in the middle but it could be anywhere in here due to the nature of light and its dual particle wave characteristics. However, if you shorten the wavelength and try to do the same thing, what you'll find is that this frequency is so high and carries so much momentum that it knocks the electron out of the way. So after you've recorded its position, you have no idea of knowing which way it's headed due to the way the light has impacted it. And this isn't just a problem with experimentation, it's something that is inherent to the world we live in. And basically what the uncertainty principle says is that it is impossible to know exactly the position of where a subatomic particle like an electron is and simultaneously know its momentum, that is, which direction it's going. It's just an inherent part of our universe that we can't know both things at the same time. So the next important thing we're going to be talking about is the Schrodinger wave equation, which is something created by Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger, who used uh, wave-particle duality to come up with an equation that treats electrons as waves. So before they sort of had the understanding that electrons could be standing waves. However, now they had a mathematical model for it. And what they found was that this equation, uh, when applied to other things like light, naturally gave way to quantization, which was something, the photoelectric effect was something that sparked the whole uh, quantum physics movement, really. And then when you combined this Schrodinger equation with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, it sort of laid the basis for modern quantum theory. 
and when you apply the mathematics of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to the Schrodinger wave equation, what you end up finding is that this equation, which treats electrons as waves and particles, gives only the probability of finding an electron, not solid orbits around a nucleus like uh, Niels Bohr proposed. So rather than finding a point at which you could see the electrons, like here, rather you would find an area of probability, like this. Well, not like that, but anyhow, uh, represented by the high peak is where you were most likely to find an electron. However, as it flattened out, you could still find one here or here. It would just be less likely. So these areas of high probability came to be known as uh, orbitals, and by quantum theory they figured out that these orbitals and something else called quantum numbers could accurately describe to some degree the uh, behavior and location of electrons within an atom. For example, these quantum numbers describe uh, the orbitals, which were again the probabilistic clouds where you could find an electron, and they describe in this order the energy level of that orbital, the shape, the orientation, in other words, which way the orbital is facing in space, and something that is uh, called the spin of an electron. And these four characteristics combine to give you a idea of how accurately how electrons behave and move within the atom. So the first of these quantum numbers is called the principal quantum number, usually given by the, uh, represented by the letter n. And what this does, it indicates the main energy level of an electron. So this somewhat corresponds to Bohr's model of the atom in which he had energy levels 1, 2, 3, and as you can note these are positive integers. And the higher the number, the higher energy. In other words, there's more potential for this to fall down towards the nucleus if it's in the 3 energy level than if it's in the 2. And this is something that Bohr had already observed and documented well in hydrogen. And the total number of orbitals within each of these energy levels is described by n squared. So there's one orbital in the first energy level, four orbitals in the second, nine orbitals in the third, etc. All right, the next quantum number is uh, something called the angular momentum quantum number, which is represented by the lowercase letter l. And basically what it describes is the shape of an orbital within an energy level. So for example, l equals zero uh, corresponds to something called an s orbital, which is a sphere of probability of finding a uh, electron. And then a p orbital corresponds to l equals 1. And a p is a sort of dumbbell shape. And as you can see, it can be oriented various different ways, which we'll get to later. And for each energy level given by the principal quantum number n, uh, there is that same number of angular momentum quantum numbers. So for n equals 1 in the first energy level, there is only an s orbital. So there's only l equals 0. And for when n equals 2, there's two different shapes it can be. It can either be this dumbbell, the p, or it can be a sphere, the s. So it can be l equals 1 or l equals 0. So l can be equal to anything up to n minus 1 or below. So it could be n minus 1, n minus 2, etc. Depending on how high up you go. The way you write these in sort of standard orbital notation would be instead of writing n equals 1, l equals 1, 
what you would do is you would write n, so you'd write 1, and then the orbital shape. So 1s or 2p or 2s, whatever you wanted to do. The third number is something known as the magnetic quantum number, and what that does is it designates the orientation of an orbital. Uh, for an s orbital, where l equals 0, it doesn't really matter because the sphere is oriented the same no matter what. But for a p orbital, let's say, where it can be oriented this way or this way or this way, uh, you need different values to indicate that orientation. So for example, this would be m equals negative 1. This would be m equals 0. And this would be m equals 1. And in case you haven't noticed, m, unlike l and n, can be a negative number. And m can actually range anywhere from negative l to l. So, for example, if you look at the p orbital, which is given by the value l1, l equals 1, then you can have m's that are negative 1, 0, or 1. Or if you were to go up to a d orbital, which is the next one above p, it has a value of l equals 2, then you could have things from negative 2, negative 1, 0, all the way up through positive 2. And the final number is something called the spin quantum number, which for electrons can be either one half or negative one half. And the reason there's only two options is because within each one of these orbitals right here, you have actually, or can have up to, two electrons. And what this these opposite spins do is ensure that the electrons don't have the same quantum numbers at the same time, which is something that they aren't allowed to have based on a principle we'll learn about in the next section.